Well, hello everyone. Welcome again to the Functional Aging Summit 2021. Really glad that you guys are with us and super excited to be here with uh, my good friend Evan Osar talking about hip function. Uh, definitely this is a topic that probably all need a little bit more uh, uh, information and insight into, I'll tell you. Um, it, it's one that uh, we deal with all the time. And if you're not dealing with it, you probably don't know uh, what people are struggling with because they probably, you probably need to deal with it. Uh, but just a few uh, things right up front. Uh, we, we got 60 minutes for the session. Evan's got a lot of content here. So we'll see if there's some time at the end for questions. You can, you can put them in the chat if you do have questions. We'll see if we can get to them uh, along the way. Uh, but if not, feel free to uh, get in touch with uh, Evan directly. Um, Evan, if, if I probably don't need to introduce him at all. If you've been around FAI for any length of time, you know Evan and his great work. He's always one of our more popular uh, presenters. Uh, the information he provides is very science-based. It's very clinical in nature and very practical and things that, that you can use with your clients to really start seeing results very quickly, typically. And he has a great way of just breaking down the anatomy. He knows the anatomy very well uh, and helping you to understand it. So we're really excited uh, to have Evan back. He runs a lot of different programs. He's written a number of books. I'm not gonna detail all those. He can tell you a little bit more about that, but his, his um, expertise really is in this area of corrective exercise and as a movement specialist. And so we really appreciate um, his focus, especially because he really focuses on our population, right? That 50 plus population that needs so much of the corrective exercise strategies. So if you're new to corrective exercise, Evan is the guy to follow, let me tell you in this. And if you're just dabbling in it, he's one to go deeper, deeper in it and it really uh, yield valuable benefits for your clients. So Evan, so glad that you're here. Thank you for uh, presenting once again for us. We look forward to your information. Awesome. Thank you so much. And you took two minutes of my time. So now I got 58 minutes exactly. left. Talk faster. It's, it's okay. I truly appreciate Functional Aging Institute. They are some of the most wonderful individuals in the industry. So grateful for this organization. And most importantly, for those of you that support FAI and our work, it's really been an, an incredible opportunity to collaborate with like-minded individuals. And I've met some of my closest individual colleagues, my closest industry colleagues through the Functional Aging Institute. My friend, I can see her on the screen right over there, JB, Jackie Bachmeyer, one of my closest friends in the industry. She hooked me up with my other, one of my other best friends right over here, Robert Linkle. He's right here in the bunker. I should say, I'm, I'm in his bunker in, in California, Northern California. So grateful to have met so many wonderful individuals and especially individuals that work with this population. Those of you that are part of this organization, I wanna thank you for giving up your weekend and spending it with us to help you better help your clients. So in this session, I'm gonna help you create strategies and add to the things that you already do super well so that you can improve hip function, whether your client has chronic tightness, osteoarthritic changes, and or their pre or post surgery, because this information will be applicable regardless of the population that you work with. And I'd like to start out talking about where this information came from, because it's gonna be very different. If you're new to our information, it's gonna be very different from what you've learned in the industry. What I learned in the in industry 23 years ago or so, <laughs> because I got taught that everybody had short, tight hip flexors and everybody had long, weak glutes. That's exactly how I was trained as a personal trainer before I got into chiropractic. And it's exactly what I was taught through all the rehab classes I took through chiropractic college and all my, all my post-grad studies as well. And when I first moved to Chicago, Illinois out of chiropractic college, I was working with professional dancers. So these are the, these are the best dancers, some of the best dancers in the world, the best dancers in Chicago. And I re remember this girl in particular, she came to me, this dancer, and she said, and I, and I would always ask, like, you know, back in the day, I'd be like, hey, well, where do you want me to work? Where are you feeling really, really tight? She's like, oh, my hip flexors are always so tight, like most dancers would say. So I remember doing an assessment. I would always do my assessments before I worked with the, these dancers. And I'm like, hmm, she, she looks like she's in an anterior pelvic tilt. But then when I actually went to assess the length of her hip flexors, I'm like, huh, it seemed very long and actually over lengthened. But pr practical for, for a dancer. But I'm like, hmm, they feel, they look really stretched out. Over lengthened. And I'm like, but she feels tight there. 
and that's where she wants me to release. So I just did a lot of release work. I did some myofascial work and then I stretched her. And she's like, oh, you can go further and gave her a really good stretch, stretch a really good length. And I looked at her after the session. I'm like, huh, she looks like she's in more anterior pelvic tilt now. And then I couldn't understand why. Well, that dancer ended up getting hurt. And if you can, if you just think about for a moment, you know, professional athlete and me as the professional working on them, I hurt them. All of a sudden you lose all credibility with the dancer. And I'm sort of, sort of a slow individual. And when I learn, I need to be taught things over and over and over and over again. I didn't really understand it. And I just kind of blew it off. Like, huh, that must be just, you know, whatever. But then it happened to another client, an older client that was more in her fifties to sixties. And I remember doing the same exact protocol with her. And then she hurt through, she threw her back out that night. And I'm like, huh. And then it happened very shortly after I was working with a client in the gym. He was in his early seventies and I did the exact same protocol. He threw his back out, putting his gym bag into the car after the session he comes hobbling back in. He's like, I can't move my back. And I'm like, what is going on here? Something that I'm learning and doing is not right. Because now it's like, this is not coincidence anymore. We'll talk about coincidence before we leave today, but this is not coincidence. I mean, this is, something's happening here. Something I'm doing is not appropriate. And that really is what we put me on this path, on this journey to learn more about the psoas, the glutes, and more specifically how to improve hip function. And this is my client that came in pretty recently. He was actually working with a personal trainer, had chronic low back issues, glute amnesia. And this is him 30 minutes later. I can create those changes in my office now because I learned from those early mistakes. And I still make lots of mistakes. I still have lots of failures in my clinic. But remember, it's the, it's the failures that you learn from. You're validated by your successes. You're learning. You grow. You develop. You evolve from your failures. And this happened. This guy got off the table. And I showed him the before and after pictures. And he's like, oh, my God, I look so much thinner. I look like I actually have glutes. I'm like, yeah, you have glutes because your strategy, not your strength. It wasn't a strength issue. And I'm not saying you don't need to teach your clients better strength strategies or do resistance training or power training. <laughs> Bless you. Just turn, just mute your phone, please, or your, or, or your computer. Robert and I just did an entire four, pre, four hour pre-con on power training, strength training for the older adults. So strength is very important. The way you create changes so that your client can safely do resistance training is you change their strategy. That's what I want you to take home from. So in your notes, circle strategy, put a star next to strategy. You want to help your clients create, develop a more optimal strategy. And I love this quote by Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And when we, when we think about the hip and what we're learning, what we've all learned, like I said, I learned this over 23, 25 years ago in the industry that everybody's got short, tight hip flexors. Everybody's got weak glutes. Everybody needs more hip mobility. And sometimes that just ain't so. So that's what I want to share with you today. The most appropriate way to look at anatomy, biomechanics, and motor control, how the brain is controlling the muscles and the body, the assessments that will help you determine where your client is at and the appropriate exercise progressions. I'm gonna show you the three most effective corrective exercises for improving the hip. And then if we have time, <laughs> show you some functional exercise progressions. When we, when we look at clients, whether they're your age, you know, my age, you know, younger than us, whether they're older than us, we look at them and we often have been told, oh, they just need to get stronger. And I'm not denying the fact that clients need to get stronger. There's almost nothing that strength will not improve. There's almost no health income or I should say outcome, that strength, additional strength won't help. However, when we look at our clients, it's not simply a strength issue. Because if we thought it was, or think it's just a strength issue, then how come these strong individuals also have hip issues? I was working with a power lifter, squats, no joke, this 21-year-old kid, he's a PhD student, I say kid because 21-year-old is, is a kid to me. <laughs> 21 years of age, squats 700 pounds, 700 pounds, comes into my office. I muscle tested his glutes, weak, chronic low back pain. Not when he squats 700 pounds. He's got low back pain when he was a PhD student. When he's sitting, studying for his PhD, when he's down on the floor playing with his niece and nephew, he's like, oh, I get up and I, I can barely stand up. So what I want you to understand is that whole concept of strategy. This guy, this kid had a great 
high level strategy. When he's braced up, when he's lifting, when he's locked in, no problems. Why is that? Because he's not moving. There's no mobility there. So he can brace down, lock down. Everything's really cool for him. As soon as he doesn't need to brace down and lock down, that's when he has his issues. And for a lot of our older clients, when you think about when, how, how they stand, how they move, how they conduct their life, they've just braced down and locked down and they have a very rigid strategy. A healthy strategy, strategy, a robust strategy, a resilient strategy is one that seamlessly goes from a position of mobility and movement to one of stability. The more seamless that your transition, the more effortless movement is. The more efficient movement is, the better your, the quality of life for your client. And when you look at a great athlete, what a at, great athlete does is they seamlessly move from a position of stability and control to a position of mobility and fluidity. The more efficient that process is, the more effortless the athlete looks like. When you, you see a great athlete, you're like, oh my God, they just look so fluid, so free, so open. That's because they're super efficient. Their strategy is super efficient. The transition from stability to mobility is seamless. That's what we want to create for our clients because that's what they're missing. That's ultimately what drives their issues. So when I was first developing this concept, I wanted to have, a, I needed a way to, to instill this idea that it's not just strength that allows individuals to be stable, to allow individuals to be to function in a relatively pain-free state. And then I saw that these images and I'm like, that's it right there. Because when you look at these little skinny women, look at them all, they're all skinny, little tiny little skinny arms, tiny little skinny legs, but they lift massive loads, massive loads on top of their head. And they walk for miles upon miles and they don't break down. Look at this woman in the middle image, right? Barrel of water on her head, little baby on her back. Like that's functional training, right? We should have all our clients doing that. Don't, don't have your clients do that because that will break them down very quickly. I tried this with a barrel of a, a, a six pack or 24 pack of, of water and, and I got a, maybe a block with it and my wife's like, you need to stop. And I'm like, yeah, I need to stop because my, my head is being compressed down into my neck, right? But if you, if you see what these women do, they do three things super well that allows them to carry these massive loads. No, the, and basically it's ABCs, right? They align their joints. So take your finger like this. Here's a great illustration for your clients. When your joint is aligned up, so, so when we think about the finger joint, think about your finger, your knuckle right there. When your finger is aligned, here, do this with me. So please do this with me so you understand this concept. When you push straight down, your joint is in the best position for loading. Now turn your finger like this and just push down like that. Now you could hold that for a little period of time, not very long. You could hold this position for a long period of time and not injure your finger joint. How long could you hold that position before your finger joint really, really hurt? And you start to overstretch ligaments and, and muscles and fascia on one side and shorten them on the other side. So you need alignment to put the joint in the best position for loading. Now, what you don't see these ladies doing is breathing. How do you know these ladies are breathing well? Because breathing is what creates the, the pressure inside the cylinder. The cylinder is a rib cage over top of pelvis. So when you have a cylinder, it's kind of like this water bottle. When the cap is on the water bottle, you can't compress this water bottle. Oh, I mean, I can, if it was full, I couldn't, but you, it's hard to compress this water bottle. But as soon as you pop the cap off or you pop the top of a soda can, it's very compressible now because you change that internal pressure. Breathing is what creates and develops and maintains that internal pressure so that when you load, when these ladies load on top of their head, they aren't compressed. When they load with, if you were to load with external loads like a squat or a deadlift, you, you're, the external loads don't compress your cylinder. When you contract your muscles, remember your, your muscles only know how to do one thing, contract and compress you. If you have great intra-abdominal pressure, intrathoracic pressure, that pressure regulation because you're breathing well, when, you, when your muscles contract, all they know how to do then is how to rotate you or how to move you or how to control motion. They don't pull you together. Now, compare that to your older clients. What do you see? You see that compression. That's because their muscles are now pulling them to, the muscles are just pulling together. That's all they know how to do. Unless there's something internally that's resisting that pull. Think about it. now they're gonna lift heavy loads, their groceries, their kids do, do yard work, bags of soil and things like that. 
Now all the external loads are just compressing them down. So we need something internally that decompresses you. That's what three-dimensional breathing is all about. So align, breathe. The third thing you need is motor control. Motor control is how your muscles use your body or use them, how your, should say, let me rephrase that. How your nervous system tells the muscles and uses the muscles to control the joint positions and then to produce the movement, to reduce the movement. And if you look at this woman way at the far end here in the pink or the red, you'll notice that when she's stepping, she's got the, the load on her head, her pelvis is actually shifting and transitioning or translating out to the side. Because during normal gait, your pelvis shouldn't always stay perfectly straight. It does a little undulation side to side. It undulates and rotates as well. That's healthy hip motion, healthy joint motion. She's not just locked in. She's not just braced in walking like a robot, right? Like our industry really teaches us to lock everything in and just be braced. There's a time to be braced, absolutely, absolutely. There's a time and place where you need to brace when you're lifting heavy loads. There's also a time when you need to be mobile. So when was she likely braced? When do you think at what point was this woman likely braced? In order to get, that, to get that load on top of your head, well, you better have a good bracing strategy to get the load on top of her head, right? Now, once the load's there, it's like loading that finger. Your, 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 finger, your spine is like your finger. You're loading the spine. As long as you're loading and you're aligned well, you're breathing well to maintain that internal pressure, now you can sort of let things go and let things just kind of do what they need to do because you're rotating around the axis. And this is what Robert and I talked, we had a four hour pre-con, so please. <laughs> so thank you for everybody that, that was on it. If you, if you didn't get it, you can get the copy of the recording. We talked about this entire concept. We don't have time to go into it here, but go back and watch it. We, we go over all the exercise progressions, the corrective exercises to help you align and get clients rotating and developing power better. But this is a concept right here. This slide is the most important slide of this presentation. Because if you get this concept, everything else we do is all about aligning, breathing, controlling. How do we use our exercises to set this position up? So we first develop our strategy. When do we first develop our strategy? There's one point of our life when we develop everything the way we're supposed to develop before anybody interfered with us, before we had surgery, trauma, injury, all those things that took us out of normal or optimal, I should say, optimal alignment, breathing control. Everything was working the way it was supposed to work. We didn't care that we had a fat belly or a big butt. We weren't trying to pull the butt in or pull the belly in. We didn't care what we looked like. That was when we were all children. We used these positions like my little niece is doing, the happy baby position. If you look at her in the middle image, what position is she in? She's in a plank position. What position is she in, in the far right image? She's in that split stance position. These are all the positions that we use with our clients in the, the workout, right? We use the modified dead bug or we use the, the, the dead bug position, right? We use the quadruped, the plank position. We use split stance position, split squat positions. We were set up for those exercises way back then. What happens to our clients is that they have many, many decades of moving away from this position. And even some of our clients that come to us and have been exercising, the exercises have completely taken them away from a lot of these positions and have set them up for not great strategies. So what we want to do is like look at what those women did above us in the last slide and what we did as children and what other group of athletes actually does this super well. Robert and I were talking about this yesterday. Like what group of athletes, if I, if I give you a choice, power lifters, bodybuilders, or Olympic lifters, which of those three groups of lifters, power lifters, bodybuilders, or Olympic lifters, which of them are the most efficient lifters? Meaning, what do they do really well? Align, breathe, control. Which of those three groups does that the best? I didn't ask which, who's the strongest. I asked who's the most efficient at aligning, breathing, controlling. It's your Olympic lifters because they learn technique. They learn form and they know if they're doing a snatch and their shoulder is not in the exact right position, they're going to risk injuring their shoulder or their back or their neck. So what do they do? Boom, they just drop the weight. They never, for, you don't see them struggling and trying to get their shoulder in position. No, they never do. They boom, put it down. Let me reset. Let me retry that. But a bodybuilder does what? 10 more, right? And then they'll do anything to get 10 more repetitions, right? Power lifters. Amazing athletes, right? But they're changing their alignment because they're trying to move the, the load the shortest distance. 
Olympic lifters never do that. The good, I should say, the good Olympic lifters never do that, okay? So I want you to think about that there are, they are athletes that are doing exactly what I'm discussing. We just don't really think about them as often as we should. We default to the strong athletes, the athletes lifting a lot of weight or the athletes doing the sexy stuff on TV or on, the, on social media. Let's default to the athletes who actually perform the best and are truest to how the body should be moving like we all learned at one point in our life. I'm gonna go quick, quickly through the anatomy. So that way we can get to the assessments and the exercises so, you, so you're set up for success. Now, when we looked at the psoas, remember I said, I, I thought everybody had a short, tight psoas because that's what I learned. It's exactly what I learned from day one personal training, day one chiropractic college, every single continuing education seminar workshop I went to, there was all telling me the psoas was short until I had that dancer that started to make me rethink what the psoas was all about and how it functioned. In 2005, I was teaching a workshop here in the US. The one person in the world that was researching this, the psoas was presenting in Scotland. Janice and I were still relatively new in our relationship. She jumped on a plane, she flew over to Scotland because I wanted that information. She brought it back and he was the first, Sean Gibbons was doing the research. He was the first person that started to change my thought process on the psoas and what the psoas is. So if you look at these images here, the psoas is a dynamic muscle. It attaches from T11, T12, L1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It attaches to, fascially blends into the diaphragm. So why does the psoas fascially blend into the diaphragm? It fascially blends into the transversus abdominis. So why does the muscle that's a hip flexor attach to all those areas and all those muscles? Then it goes down and attaches into the front side of the pelvis. Sometimes it's referred to as psoas minor, but 40% of us don't have a psoas minor. However, those of us that don't have psoas minor, we have a fascial attachment from the psoas major that goes out to the pelvis. It also fascially blends into the pelvic floor. So again, why does the muscle that's a hip flexor attach into the pelvic floor? And then it goes down to insert into the lesser trochanter, that little bony area down in the front side of your hip and your groin. So if you look at a muscle, and if you look at this middle image, here's the spine. So this is like, if you cut somebody from top to bottom in half and you're looking down, here's the vertebrae here, here's the belly button out here in the front. You see the psoas muscle sitting right against the spine, right in the front of the spine. It's the only spinal stabilizer in the front side of your spine. I should have gave you a hint right there of what the muscle actually does. And if you see this image here, I didn't have this image drawn. My, 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 the artist for my book was like, you know, Dr. Osa, the, 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 the psoas doesn't attach to the diaphragm in the pelvic floor. I'm like, yes, it does. I just need you to draw it. Don't question me, just draw the, the image. <laughs> so she drew me this image and I, and I love this image because your psoas is the fascial connection, that myofascial connection from the diaphragm down into your pelvic floor. So when we look at the psoas as attachments, the spine, the diaphragm, the transverse abdominis, the pelvic floor, the pelvis, and the hip. Does it sound like a muscle whose primary job it is to just flex the hip? Absolutely not. So what does it do? It functions to stabilize the trunk, the bottom of the trunk, the rib cage, the spine, the pelvis, and the hip complex. In fact, what it does is it, it does compress. So when you're aligned well, it will compress you so that the spine is then stable. It will also draw the hip into the socket. So it pulls the ball into the socket. So then all your primary hip muscles, your hip flexors, for, for example, what are the primary hip flexors? It's not the psoas. It's actually the rectus femoris and the sartorius. These muscles, these two muscles, and tensor fascia lata is a third. So sartorius, rectus femoris, and tensor fascia lata. These muscles have big lever arms. They cross many joints, or a couple joints, I should say. They have better ability to flex your hip than the psoas because the psoas is really close to the joint axis. And when muscles that are close to the joint axis, they don't have a great lever arm to create motion. Their job is to maintain the position of the joints that they cross. So the psoas's job is really to maintain the position of the spine, the pelvis, and that ball and socket joint. It aids in respiration and also aids in mobilization of the hips so the other hip flexors can work well. So if you look at a sprinter, what I love about that image right there is we, we, we hear in our industry, you have to contract muscles to make them work, to make them work better. But what actually gets your glute to work better? It's not just contraction of the glute, it's you have to preload it. So if you think of a rubber band, you have to preload the muscle to make it then contract faster and stronger. If you don't pre-contract the muscle, the muscle contraction is very weak and limited. So if you look at this athlete, 
on his right side where he's hip flexing, that's preloading the hip so that he can then, boom, extend back and drive himself forward. But you need hip flexion, strong hip flexion. And if you notice, what do you notice about his core, his thoracopelvic cylinder? It's a cylinder. It's solid. You don't see him wasting any movement because he needs a cylinder to be solid so then he can detract off a solid foundation. So now when we start to think about strategy, the best way to improve hip function is to improve the cylinder function because the hip is a ball and socket hanging from the cylinder. The shoulder is a ball and socket hanging from the cylinder. Your head is essentially a, an extremity hanging from your cylinder or position above your cylinder. The better the cylinder functions, that thoracopelvic cylinder, the better these ball and joint sockets, including your head, the better those joints function as well. Now, glute max. If we think about the glute max, glute max, again, huge, thick muscle. Probably the, it is the most dense muscle maybe except for the gastroc soleus, but the, besides that, it's the most dense muscle in the body. It has connections from your pelvis. So here, well, what I want you to do is put your hand on your pelvis. So put your hand right here. That's the top of your iliac crest. If you go right behind it here, that's your glute max. That's the attachment of the glute max right to the top of your iliac crest. Now slide your fingers over to your sacrum. It's coming off your sacrum. It also comes all the way down here. It comes out of your coccyx, your tailbone. It's also coming out. The deep fibers come off the lower sacrum and even have coccygeal fibers, your tailbone. Now, it, that, that's not the only attachments. It has fascial attachments across your low back into that thoracolumbar fascia. Thoracolumbar fa fascia is that big diamond, or that thick diamond fiber structure in your low back that the lats also attach to. So your right glute is attaching into your left lat. So when we look at the glute function, and if we say a comment, if we make a comment that, oh, this person has weak glutes, do they really have weak glutes? Because how can the glutes work unless that cylinder is aligned, unless that opposite lat is working well, unless the other attachment of your glute, the, the iliotibial band, unless that's also working well. So when we think about weak glutes, can it ever be weak glutes alone? We have to look again at the global structure and say, how are these glutes working with everything else in the body, not just isolate ourselves to the glutes, even though today we'll isolate ourselves to the glutes. <laughs> okay, then the glutes come down, they attach, as I mentioned, into the gluteal tuberosity, which is deep in your, in the backside of your hip joint. So there's deeper fibers, the superficial fibers, the glute fibers that you can put your hand on, the ones you see in the mirror, the ones you see on, on people with your eyes, those are the superficial fibers. They attach into your IT band, they go down to your lateral leg, into the fibular head to attach there. So again, when we look at the glutes, we're like, hmm, we've learned that this is a hip extender. But then why does it attach to all these other areas? The lats, the thoracolumbar fascia, the iliotibial band, down to the lateral knee? Because it also has lots of other functions besides hip, function, hip extension. So number one, the glute functions as a hip stabilizer. We, we always hear about the glute medius as a hip stabilizer, and it is. The glute max also is a very powerful hip stabilizer, especially as you get onto the single leg stance. Because what it's doing is as you get onto the single leg stance, it's contracting and pulling on that IT band. So check out this runner here. As a glute max pulls on the IT band, the muscle underneath the IT band, your vastus lateralis, is pushing out into the IT band. That's what ultimately allows you to stand on one leg and create that stable leg. It helps obviously for walking because when your left lat goes forward, you should say your left shoulder comes forward, your right leg is coming forward. Well, that's winding up. It's that myofascial, it's that rubber band analogy again. You're winding up that posterior oblique chain, that lat thoracolumbar fascia to the opposite glute. It's winding up that chain. So that way, when you wind up the chain, then the chain just contracts and doesn't even contract essentially. It's just using elastic properties of that myofascial chain to propel you forward. So that way, walking becomes very efficient and very you use very little energy as you're walking. When you're walking efficiently, think about your older clients now. They don't walk very efficiently. So they don't wind up very well. They don't rotate very well because in order to wind up that chain, you have to rotate. If you're not rotating, you start walking like this. And think about how many of your clients are walking through the frontal plane. They're not winding up this anterior or posterior oblique chain. So therefore their gait pattern, their walking becomes super inefficient. That requires more energy, more effort, more muscle, muscular con contraction. They're basically throwing their weight over to this side, then they gotta throw their weight over to this side. And then somehow they gotta decelerate that. 
So now you, you can start to get a sense like, wow, this is why my client is having that hip pain or that back pain or that knee pain, because a lot of these areas are just compensating for the lack of being able to wind up and rotate and side bend, I should, 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 should say, let me rephrase it. Being able to rotate and eat, stretch out these elastic chains. Finally, your glute is also a powerful rotator. It's a rotator of your hip, which is basically a rotator of your hip complex. So when you stand, let me lower this down. When you stand and step onto your right leg, so do this with me. So, so if you're watching, obviously you're watching this on your computer, put your hands on your pelvis. Step onto your right leg. When you step onto your right leg, your pelvis initially rotates internally, or I should say your hip joint rotates internally. So your glute has to control that internal rotation. Otherwise you just keep going that direction. But then it also, I should say, and then it also has to externally rotate you to propel you forward. So it controls internal rotation. It decelerates internal rotation. And then it helps to accelerate you out of that position to propel you forward. So it accelerates or creates external rotation of the hip. So again, dynamic muscle, huge muscle with implications in stability, walking, and rotation. And now you, you can get a sense here with, that this is a very complex group of muscles, the psoas and the glutes, and they work together to create that optimal strategy. And when they don't work collectively together, when the cylinder, that thoracopelvic cylinder is not working well, then other things need to compensate. We're gonna look at that, we're gonna look at that next. So glutes plus psoas give you optimal posture movement where your cylinder is aligned. The ball is centered in the socket and then we get optimal movement. Now that allows us to do all the exercises we do with our clients. That's the bird dog, a well done bird dog. That's a single leg step up, a well performed single leg step up. Now here's what happens for a lot of our clients. We have, we start to lose efficiency. We lose postural alignment. We get compensations from surgery, trauma, injuries, things we've been taught. And then we start to compensate. What's great about our nervous system is that the nervous system is a great compensator. Because remember, many years ago when we didn't have the luxuries we have today, and I love the modern luxuries that we have today. I don't wanna be foraging out in the mountains for my food and, and, and creating fires and going, going and finding water. I like to turn on my faucet and just have a nice glass of water, right? I mean, you can't drink the water here in the Midwest, but <laughs> be without filtering it, but you get the idea. So think about this. You're running away. You're, you're trying to chase your food down, right? And your food's running away from you and you got a bad hip. Well, your body's got to compensate somehow. Otherwise you and your family, your tribe don't eat. So you just find a way to make it happen, right? Somebody's coming in to attack your, you, your family, trying to take what, the, what you have away from you. Well, you got to fight. They don't care. Your body doesn't care. Your nervous system doesn't care that you got some low back pain or a bad ankle, right? So we, We've developed these areas and these ways of compensating that are super effective. It doesn't mean it's optimal. doesn't mean it's efficient. doesn't mean it will keep you a long period of time or, or give you that quality of life. It just means that it will compensate. One of the biggest compensation strategies we'll see with our clients is over gripping that posterior hip complex. And I want you guys to feel this and experience this. So I want you to stand up again. You have to feel it because if you don't feel it, you don't get the, this concept of why we don't of why we teach what we teach, and why I believe some of our industry is teaching and actually leading to hip developing hip issues. So stick your fingers behind your greater trochanter. Find that bone right here. So that's your greater trochanter. That's where your glute medius attaches to. So find that bone. Put your fingers behind it. Stick your thumbs in your groin in, in front of your hip. Now your hip joint, the ball is right underneath. So, so basically you're like this on your pelvis, the ball, the hip and the ball and joint socket is right below your fingers. You can't feel it because it's below a lot of soft tissues. Now I want you to go into your squat position to so squat. And when you come up, squeeze your glutes as if you're driving that pelvis forward. Like many of us have been taught. My, I was taught so many times, come down, come back up, squeeze, squeeze. And what do you feel happening underneath your fingers? The ball moves forward. Remember I said, the ball should be centered in the socket, regardless of where you're moving. If you're flexing, if you're extending, squatting, lunging, bending, the ball should stay relatively centered in the socket. And what do you feel happening underneath your fingers as you squeeze your glutes? The ball is moving where? It's moving forward. Now, keep that ball forward. Squeeze that glute, keep your glutes squeezed. Now, 
Keep a good squeeze. Now go into your squat position. What happens? How do you squat? Watch my pelvis here on the screen. The pelvis does what? It goes into posterior tilt and your knees go forward. Doesn't that look like a lot of our older clients squat when they first come to see us? They squat without getting their hips back into anterior pelvic rotation. They stay in posterior pelvic rotation. What does that overload? It overloads my lumbar spine. What else does it overload? You guys probably feel it right now as you're doing this. You feel it in your knees because you're overloading your knees. What are the two most common orthopedic injuries? Low back and knees, right? That's not the only issue. Let's do this again. So feet together now. We're gonna do this assessment in a little bit. Squeeze your glutes. Now reach forward towards the floor. Can't go very far, can you? Because what? You're not releasing the posterior hip complex, the glutes and the hamstrings to allow you to get forward bend. Why do we need forward bend? I mean, that's most of everyday life. If you're not sitting, you're not standing and walking, you're doing what? You're doing something where you're bending forward, bending down into a cabinet, bending forward on the countertop, bending forward to brush your teeth. Most of life is bending forward. But if you have shortness in your glutes, in your external hip rotators, in your hamstrings, you can't get forward bend. You have to compensate somewhere. Now think about this, this client doing a deadlift with someone that hasn't taught them well. They're like, oh, that hurts my low back. So then they go to their doctor because I heard this. I heard a doctor, a medical doctor, an orthopedic surgeon. He said this at a conference. I was at a medical fitness conference. We we're both presenting. And he, he got up before me and he's like, older people should not deadlift. And I, and I just wanted, I, want, I literally wanted to throw my book at it and stand up and say, how can you say that to these fitness professionals? Because, boo, you're right. Because, because he's taking it out of context. No, we should be good enough at our jobs, health and fitness professionals, to teach someone how to hip hinge properly. Because if you tell someone they can't deadlift, then how do you get down to the floor to lift anything of any weight off the floor? No, we should be teaching our clients how to hip hinge so that they can deadlift, so that they can take the stress off their back and off their knees. And that's what I, why I hate hearing fitness professionals say things like that. And, and doctors say, mostly doctors, not, it's not fitness professionals, but doctors say things like that because it disempowers us as health and fitness professionals to do the right things for our clients. We have to teach our clients how to use their hips appropriately, how to get, write this down. You need your client to get anterior pelvic rotation. Remember, that's what stretches out. That's what loads up your posterior hip complex so that you can then, boom, come back up. Without the preload, you have to overuse your back to come up. You have to overlock your knees out to come back up. But as long as you get that alignment of your cylinder, that thoracopelvic cylinder, and eccentrically load that posterior chain, that just works. All you got to do is get back up. That's all the muscles that myofascial chain does is get you back up out of that position. I hope that makes sense. That's a number one strategy that will change your client's number two strategy. Over. Breathing is the number one strategy that will change your client's lives. Number two is the hip hinge. If you teach people, your clients, number one, how to breathe better and more optimally, and you get them doing it well and throughout the day as part of the regular routine, and you teach people how to hip hinge, no joke, you can transform their lives. My wife is doing, my wife, Janice, is doing, Janice Maddock is doing a session on breathing. She'll talk about her own personal story. Please listen to it, even on a recording. Listen to her personal story. She was living off medication. She was diagnosed with migraine headaches, living off medications from the time she was five to the time I met her when she was 25. 20 years of, of over-the-counter medications, Advil every day, um, birth control pills, had no period. Think about that. Can you imagine? She's now 45. Actually, she's 46. She, no, 47. <laughs> 47. She's like, dude, you don't know my age. She's 47 now. Can you imagine if she had another 22 years of living off those medications, how her GI system would have been messed up, how her whole body would have been messed up from not having a period for the, next, for the last 22 years. When I say you can change people's lives, you can change people's lives with this information. Think about all your clients. Robert shares a story about his client, Linda. I, I had the pleasure of meeting her yesterday. She was told to have hip, sorry, knee replacements. 50, was it 15 years ago, buddy? Yeah, 15 years ago. She was told to have knee replacement. Here she is 15 years later. He taught her how to hip hinge and hip hinge extremely well. No hip, no knee replacements. Maybe now she's getting close to where she may need to go because now she's in her, in her 70s. So, but she, he gave her 10 to 15 years of quality life and strength and the, 
movement pattern quality. So now when she goes into her joint replacement and comes back out, she'll come out so much stronger, so much more resilient, so much more able to get back to her life after the joint replacement. That's how you change people's lives with this information. All right. So what happens is again, when you over grip your, your hips, you drive the femoral head forward and you change, you create grinding of the cartilage and ultimately you can create labral tears. The labrum is that fibrocartilaginous rim around the acetabular, the rim of the acetabulum that helps to suction cup that ball in the socket. And when you tear that labrum, you lose a lot of that function and then you have to compensate even further. I just had a client that had an MRI and again, where most of the de degeneration happens is at the top and front side of the femoral head. Why does the top and front side of the femoral head get the most issues? Well, when you grip your hip, I just showed you what happens. You drive that femoral head up and forward and now you just grind. It's just year after year after year of grinding. Your cartilage, your soft tissue do not like to be ground against. That's why your hips wear out, your shoulders wear out, your knees wear out, is because you're just over grinding, over compressing, over translating those joints. Doesn't mean that they shouldn't go through those motions of compression, translation. It just means you're compensating by putting too much motion through those joints and or too much uncontrolled force. And again, you as a health and fitness professional, you're in the best position to help these individuals. These individuals, they're good people, but they're buck rivers. Just think about this. Like, like, so check this out. <laughs> just say, let me see. Let me step away. I'm wearing kind of dark shorts. Again. You'll see, like, like, watch. When I grip my hips, look how narrow my butt looks. Like, like my, my shorts are flapping in the breeze. It's all narrow through here, no butt in the side. You know, if you look, like, I'm all, like, it just looks awful, right? It's just like all tucked under. But that looks like a lot of our old clients, right? They're kind of shuffling around in this posterior tilted position. But then if I just let my hips go, all you do is let, let my butt go, what happens? I go back to anterior pelvic tilt, which is where our clients should be, but don't force them into that position. Do not force your clients into anterior pelvic tilt. Stop your butt gripping. And now butt looks better here. Not better. I guess it does. Yeah, it does look better. <laughs> it does look better. But more importantly, it's in a position, you know, more full and round. It's in a position to be loaded. And that's the importance of being able to get into anterior. It's the importance of being able to get into anterior pelvic rotation is so that you can load those hips. Okay? So the number one key to solving any problem is number one, you have to identify, understand and identify the issue, the problem. Number two, stop doing. You must stop doing the things that led to the problem in the first place, okay? Now, that was a lot. However, please go take your notes, go back, re-listen to this recording. Because once you listen to it, Jackie will tell you, I mean, if you ever have any questions about learning information from us is number one, we know our information really, really well. Number two, we teach it really, really well. And three, we talk very, very fast. <laughs> I should say, I talk very, very fast. So you need to hear it many times. Just like when I learn something, I need to hear it probably 30 times before I finally hear it. Like my wife tells me things all the time. And then I'll hear it from Robert say, hey, you know what, dude, this and that. I'm like, oh yeah. And I'll go back and tell Janice, I'm like, Janice, Robert just said this. And she just shakes her head. Like, I've been telling you that for like months, right? <laughs> right? So, so don't feel bad. I mean, many of us need to hear things. Many of your clients, think about your clients. You have to tell them the same thing over and over and over again. Hinge, stick your hips back, get your pelvis anterior. You have to tell them that like every session sometimes, right? They need to hear things a lot. You and I need to hear things a lot to get it to stick. So don't feel bad if you need to, if you don't get everything today, you need to go back and hear it a few more times, okay? So the process I wanna take you through right now, we have, we have about, oh, I got I got 15 minutes. I wanna leave just a few minutes for questions is I wanna take you through the integrative movement system. My wife, Janice and I created this system as a way for us to work with our clients in our office. You assess, you address, you progress. That's the system because ultimately you're, you're moving your client towards their goals. Your assessments helps you identify the, your, your client's current habits, your address are your corrective exercises. This is how you address what you found in your assessments and then your progressions are the things that you already know how to do super well, okay? So you assess, you address so that you can progress your client towards accomplishing their health and fitness goals. So I'm gonna take you through this process. I'm gonna stop screen share 
right now just so we can so we can uh let me see let me stop screen share so you can actually oops stop share so because i want you guys to do this with me there's three assessments we're going to do number one i'm going to have you just stand let's go into single leg stance I want you to get a sense of your balance. Actually, let's do it this way. Get a sense of your balance. So just stand on one leg. Get a sense of what it feels like to load and get your weight onto one leg. Then switch. Let me unplug you guys here. Sorry. Then switch. Go to your other leg. Just get a sense of what it feels like just to transition weight. And even if your balance is good, you should feel a difference side to side. You should feel a difference. Like for me, little bit harder to shift onto my left leg, a little bit more gripping. Put your hand on your pelvis here. So put your hand on your pelvis right here. Get a sense of just a little bit more gripping on this left side than my right side. So I do have a difference side to side. Your body has asymmetries. It doesn't like to be super asymmetrical, okay? Now, feet together, hands on your pelvis. Have you rotate your hips to one side, get a sense of that rotation. Feet stay flat on the floor, come back to center, Rotate the other direction. Now, Robert and I just had a four hour pre-con, so I did lots and lots of these the other day. So my hip rotation today is pretty good on this left side compared to how it normally is. However, it's still a little, little limited on my left side. So rotate right, come back to center, stop, rotate left, get a sense of which side is more challenging to rotate on. Take note of that side. That's the side you're gonna work on today in our corrective exercises. So single leg stance, hip rotation, and now we're gonna look at forward bend. Feet together, hands on your thighs. Start by flexing your head down, your spine down, reach down as far as you can. Just reach towards the floor as much as you can. Come back up, don't hang out there. So this is not a stretch, this is just a forward bend assessment. Because again, forward bend is one of the major patterns your clients will do all day long. So for me, I can touch the floor, but barely, and that's a lot of stretch in my low back. I don't feel much stretch in my hamstrings, come back up. So it's just not super efficient. One more time, then come back up, okay? So we got three assessments. I'm a little less stable on my left side. I'm a little more limited in hip rotation on my left side. My forward bend just felt a lot of it in my back, stretching in my back, not a lot of stretching in my hamstrings. And you probably noticed I wasn't getting a lot of pelvic rotation. Remember the key to improving glutes as well as psoas is getting that anterior pelvic rotation. So now we're gonna go through our corrective exercises. So what we're gonna do is the three corrective exercises, the most effective ones, number one is breathing. Janice has an entire session right after me on three-dimensional breathing. So even if you watch it on recording or you watch it live, watch what she, how she teaches breathing. That's how, what we're gonna do right now, but very quickly. She'll go over all the mechanics of how to breathe. We're gonna do that right now. The second exercise we're gonna do is we're gonna do a seated hamstring length. Because again, most of your, some of your clients can't get down on the floor. I would do this on the floor, but many of your clients can't get down to the floor, so we're gonna do it in a seated position. Third one is step out. So these are gonna set your client up for success with all their progressions. So first, let's have a seat. And sit right on your sit bones. So stand up, relax, have a seat on your sit bones. Take your fingers, stick them in your lower abdomen. Stick your thumbs into your side right there. So basically, so you're feeling the space in between your back muscles and your abdominal muscles, that lateral space. Stick your fingers down towards your pelvis. We want to focus on breathing down towards the pelvis and wide into the sit bones. Why do we want to breathe that direction? Remember that the psoas is the connection from your diaphragm down to the pelvic floor. So what we're doing is we're sending the breath, we're focusing the breath, getting it down to the pelvic floor. So that way, because your diaphragm and your pelvic floor should move together when you breathe, okay? So you're gonna breathe in. We're gonna do five breaths, in and out through the nose, okay? I'll turn to the side as well. So on the sit bones, in and out through the, through the nose, go. Okay, so we're gonna breathe in, pause, breathe out, And pause. You do the pause to slow down your client's breathing. Breathe in again. And pause. And breathe out. And pause. Breathe in. Pause. 
breathe out, pause. Two more times, breathe in, pause, breathe out. Pause, last time, and breathe out. Good, okay, so breathing, number one. We do that usually in the supine position, but again, for clients that can't get down on the floor, you can also do it seated. We probably do that for three rounds, three or four rounds. Then we move into our hamstring length. We're going to do that seated again for those clients that can't get down on their, the floor. Also, if you can sit your client up a little bit higher, if you notice my pelvis is higher than my knees, so you can put an Eric's pad on their seat, get them up a little bit higher than their knee. So take your more limited side. So what I'm going to have you do is Bring the, my left side, more limited side. That side comes out forward, still on my sit bones. You're gonna square the pelvis up to that forward leg. Square the pelvis up. Square the pelvis up. So now you're gonna breathe in. As you breathe in, or after you breathe in, breathe out, hinge forward. Because what you're trying to do is get the hip to sit, sit back in the socket. Remember that the hip goes forward, up and forward. We need the hip to go back in the socket. We need to lengthen that posterior chain so that we can get anterior pelvic rotation to load that hip. That's what this allows us to do. So breathe in, breathe out, and hinge. And if you do this well, you should feel this behind your leg, the entire leg, all the way up into the glute, because we're lengthening that posterior chain, the entire posterior chain. So breathe in, breathe out, Breathe in to come back up. You're basically doing a seated hip hinge. For some of our clients, this works so well to help them retrain that idea of moving from the hip joints and not moving from the low back. Keep, get them higher, get the pelvis higher than the knee so that way they can sort of rock. They're not rocking, they're hinging, right? You can tell them they're rocking or if the pelvis is a bowl, they're pouring water out the front side of the bowl. Breathe in, come up. The bowl is level, no water is pouring out. Hinge, water is pouring out the front side of the bowl, and relax. The third pattern, we would do probably two to three sets of that as well. The third pattern is a step out pattern. This is now using what you just created in the upright position. So you align the head and neck, you align the cylinder. You hinge to preload those glutes. This is the anterior pelvic tilt, so it's not pushing the hips back. It's hinging. That's what allows the hips to go back. You hinge so the weight stays square over your foot, your foot tripod, big toe, small toe, heel. Hinge so the weight is over the entire foot. Then you step out, keeping the weight on the foot, the inside of the, my left foot, and through my glute. Then come back. Step out, and then come back. So I'm loading up that posterior hip. If your client is feeling it in their knee, they're going too far forward because they're staying in posterior pelvic tilt. Get them to start here. Hinge first, preload that position, then step, then come back control, then step. So from the behind, it's a line, hinge, step, come back. So if you watch my pelvis, the pelvis does not shift that way. It does not shift that way. It stays level as I step out. There's no rotation. Make sure when you're watching your plant from the side as well as from behind. From the front, the hip, knee, ankle, and foot should stay aligned. There should be no change of hip, knee, ankle, and foot alignment. To make it more challenging, you should put the band around the knees, but do not put the band around the knees until they've earned the right to get there. Okay, that was real quick. Let's do a reassessment. Let's see if we create the changes that our corrective exercises were set up to do. Right leg was good. Left leg, much better. Now I'm not gripping as much, and I feel more stable on that left foot. Let's look at hip rotation. Hip rotation right was good. Come back to center. Left rotation, even more free. Like, that feels awesome now. Like, it just feels like it just flows to the left easily like it does to the right. Forward bend. I felt it mostly in my back before. I couldn't really get a hamstring stretch. Now I'll go forward, and now I go all the way down. I can get almost my middle levels down on the floor, and I feel much more hamstring stretch and calf stretch than just in my low back. So there, in that very quick segment, I was able to change my strategy. That's what your corrective exercises do. Then you just take that into the functional exercise progressions. Now, obviously, you need to progress your clients. So let me go back to the presentation. Let me go back and reshare this presentation. 
and you have you have these exercises obviously if you have any questions you just reach out to us and we'll get you the information but you have all the information here you you may have done myofascial release also and this is my clients just teaching my clients how to breathe again lying position is the best position not appropriate for everyone that's why I have my my client seated and using a strap to breathe around her cylinder okay we did the hamstring lengthening we did the hip hinge again when you're doing corrective exercise, you want the pelvis relatively over top of the feet, not way far behind the feet, even though some of your older clients, they will be way far behind the feet. Ideally, you want the pelvis so, so it's almost over top of the ankle joints as you're doing your corrective exercise strategy. And then we did the step out pattern. Obviously, you need to progress your clients to squatting, lunging, bending, rotating, pushing, pulling, balance, walk, and carry patterns. And these are the progressions that we use most frequently, not all of them, but most frequently with our clients. Here's what the industry teaches here. You'll see this all the time in the gym on social media where people just thrusting that pelvis into the bar. Not a great strategy for your back. That jacked my back up real bad when I was doing that. And that's why you get one of these head shakes. <laughs> my buddy Robert loves that head shake. So this is me doing it more optimally. You align that thoracopelvic cylinder. You hinge or you grab the bar, then you are going to hinge. It's a rotation of the entire cylinder forward. If you notice, let me stop that just for a minute. Do you notice like I'm not, my, my hips transition back, but I'm not just pushing my hips back. I'm creating anterior rotation. That's why it's important to teach your clients how to hinge. The hinge creates the position so that you load that posterior hip complex. And now you just drive up. You notice. I have to use my glutes to get back up. I'm just not over squeezing and driving my pelvis forward. Hinge, drive up, not driving the pelvis forward. This, and you, for some clients, you need to change their range of motion. You see my client here. This is a guy who's failed. He had failed low back surgery, failed label, labral surgery. He's like, I want to get back to deadlifting. I'm like, well, first of all, how you're setting up, not so great. And watch what he's doing. Watch his pants. This was 135. This guy deadlifts 500 pounds. Do you, can you see why that will bother his back while it'll create back issues for surgery? Can you see why it will, it will also create an issue that for him to have labral tears? So this is us changing his strategy. We had him just elevate, taught him how to hinge appropriately, release through his posterior hips. And you see much better anterior pelvic rotation. Looks more square through his pelvis. Now he's driving up through his pelvis, his posterior hip complex without over squeezing the glutes. Much better strategy that will save his back, save his hips. You also have to teach your clients how to sit, sit on their sit bones, not underneath their sit bones, because this will undo all the great stuff that you are doing with your clients. So the number one take home, stop gripping. T teach your clients how to stop gripping unless they find themselves in this unfortunate situation, and then you better grip and grip for all that you're worth. <laughs> so conclusion, anatomy, know your anatomy, because when you know your anatomy, you understand why you assess, what you're learning from your assessments, what you're looking for, and then ultimately how you address and use your corrective exercises. Use the appropriate strategy, help your clients create a more optimal strategy that they can then take into all the fundamental movement patterns, all the strength training, the resistance training, the conditioning, the power training that you guys know how to do and do so well with your clients. I wanna leave you with a story. Sister, Sister Suzanne came in to see me early in my career. And I, I went to Catholic school and we had nuns in our school. And Sister Suzanne was a nun. She was a retired nun, a group of really cool women. And so I, I had a little like, you know, I was sort of struggling with my faith back then. And uh, I was like, oh boy, God, this is, I know this is, a, this is a test. She was a super cool woman. I taught her exactly what I shared with you here today. And a couple months later, she, she came in. She came in with chronic hip and low back pain. She come, comes in. She's like, Dr. Osar, I want you to feel my glutes. And I'm like, I'm like what? What? And she's like, put, here, put your hand. She, she takes my hand. She's like, feel my glutes. And I'm like, God, I mean, what's going, what's going on here? She, she, she's like, I've got glutes. I've got glutes. I have no low back pain and I have glutes. Like she was so excited that she actually had glutes. Here she was, 78 years of age. She was so sweet. And then she had written me a letter that I, I sort of forgot about. Again, like I said, I was struggling with, with my faith. My wife reminded me of it recently. And unfortunately, sister, sister, I had moved away and Sister Suzanne had passed away. And I found a letter on my computer. And the letter said, Dr. Osa, I just want to thank you for all your help. You know, you taught me breathing and with the breath work that you taught me, it helped me come closer to God. It helped me create 
a closer connection to God. And you never know what you're teaching. You know, like, like when, when I re- reread that a couple months ago, like it almost, I, I, I did almost start, I, I, I teared up because you never know the impact you're having on someone's life because we do what we do. You do what you do every day. And then you, if, if you're like us, and I know you are, that's why you're part of Functional Aging Institute. You wonder about those clients that, am I doing the right thing? You, you, it keeps you up at night, right? It, you know, it makes you worry during the day. Like, am I doing enough? I, I don't know if I got through to that person. You never know the impact you're having on, on individuals. And like I said, I was struggling with my faith. Um, and my wife is a very, you know, she grew up very faith-filled. And, and this is not, you know, if you don't believe in God, that's, that's, that's fine. And like, I was struggling bad, like, like where I'd be on the floor crying, like, like, like it was bad. Like I was in a dark place and my, and my wife was really worried about me. And she said to me, she's like, Evan, you know, she's like, you're the light, just be the light for others. And I talked to her uncle and her uncle was a pastor of her church. And, and I was, I was, I was just asking him some questions. And he said to me recently, he's like, he's like, all you can do is just be the light. And I'm like, wait a second, Janice just said that. The other day, Robert and I were on our pre-con and we're finishing up. And, and I just shared that message. I'm like, you know, your clients, they, they can be going through dark times. Maybe they lost a family member from COVID. Maybe they're struggling with COVID or post-COVID e- events, right? Maybe they're struggling with their business, their health, their finances, whatever, child, you know, what's going on in the world, you know? So I'm like, just be the light. And Robert said to me, he's like, dude, that's what I say. I, I, say, I say, be the light. So just remember like you and I are the light for our clients, for our communities, be the light. If you're going to post things on social media, make sure that your social media messages are also unifying, bringing people together. And what I ask myself all the time before I post something, are you being the light? Are you helping others that may be in the dark times and need that ray of hope, that sunshine coming over that dark mountain top to say, today is a different day. Today can be a better day. Today will be a better day. So I want to leave you with that. Thank you for for everything that you do for your clients, for our community. Thank you, FAI, for giving us the opportunity to share this information, share this message with you guys, and for allowing us to be part of your journey, part of FAI journey. And we, we, we love you guys. And we love being part of this industry because I truly believe that we can change the world. Just be the light.